Okay, this is just a brief overview about what we're going to be discussing today. Um, first, we're going to define what human trafficking is and what it means to all of you. Uh, second, we will define uh, specifically sexual trafficking and discuss why children are the focus of that specific definition. Uh, next, we will discuss the most common myths that uh, about domestic minor sexual trafficking occurring in the United States. And finally, we will continue the interactive presentation with your questions. Um, I ask, please don't limit yourself. If there's anything that you want to ask, please feel free. Don't feel like you should be limited, especially because of the subject matter. <coughs> okay, what is human trafficking? Is there anybody in here that would like to be the first to speak besides me. Is there anybody that wants to give an opinion about what human trafficking means to them? Anybody at all? Um, human trafficking would be basically a trade, in, a trade in for, uh, it's a trade for humans just for sexual, uh, for sexual acts or for any type of sexual exploitation. Okay, sexual exploitation, that's definitely part of human trafficking. Anybody else? Yes? It can also be for manual labor, kind of an indentured servitude. Um. Exactly. Uh, labor trafficking. Human trafficking is a very, very broad statement. It, and it gets, um, you, you start getting into the more subcategories of uh, human trafficking. Um, the actual definition from the Department of Justice is the U.S. Department of Justice Title 18, Chapter 77 of the U.S. Criminal Code defines human trafficking as an act of compelling or coercing a person's labor, services, or commercial sexual acts. So yes, this would include sexual trafficking, labor trafficking, indentured servitude, which is where you work for somebody and you never get any money. You just continue working and working and working and they pay for your housing, kind of like um, back when the railroad was being built. You would work for the railroad company and by the end of the week, you would owe the company more money than they would owe you and you would pay that to the company store. That's a very good e example of indentured servitude. Um, but what we're here to talk about today is sexual trafficking, specifically um, sexual trafficking of children. So, sexual trafficking. What is sex trafficking? Uh, does anybody want to give this one a stab? It's okay, you don't have to. <coughs> uh, selling people? That's okay. Shout it out. It's a small room. I'm guessing selling people. That's okay, you can, you can guess. That's, that's what I'm here for, is to uh, clear things up. So selling people, selling people, okay. That's cool. Yes? Using someone's sexual nature for profit. Sex for profit. Use somebody else's for sex for profit. That's a very good point. Okay, well the DOJ definition of sex trafficking, thank you. Uh, it further defines sexual trafficking, now this is the same law that I quoted earlier, is a commercial sex act induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform the act has not attained 18 years of age. Would anybody like to guess why it is that they specifically mention minors in this definition? Anybody? It's, you're, you're, on the, you're on the right path. Um, it, it is because at, on the federal level, um, nobody, under the, nobody under the age of 18 is allowed to consent to sex. So it would be very unfair, um, which it has happened over the last few years, we're getting better about it, but it would be very unfair to arrest a child for a commercial sex act when they themselves legally can't consent to sex. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. so. We've got the definition of sex trafficking, but what we're here to talk about is the commercial sexual exploitation of children. Anybody can be a sex trafficking victim. Any person in this room could be a sex trafficking victim. It does not matter your age, your sex, your race, none of those things. But 
The reason we are talking about children today is because children have a tendency to be at higher risk for sexual trafficking, specifically within the United States. Okay, how many kids are we talking about in the United States that are being victimized by sexual trafficking? Well. The Center for Missing and Exploited Children, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this or if they still do this, but back in the day, there used to be signs inside the grocery stores. You'd walk in and there'd be missing, missing persons. Most of them were children and it would give a description of the child and who last time they were seen and of those nature. Uh, this is the same organization that has come up with this statistic that uh, they estimate that every year there is 100 to 293,000 children at risk for sexual trafficking in the United States. Would anybody like to guess how many available beds there are for those children if they need rehabilitation? Anybody? There, are, there is about 100 available right now. So I'm sure you guys can do the math and tell that it's, uh, eh, the numbers don't speak well. Okay. So sexual trafficking um, recently, in the last, I'd say, three years or so, has become very, very popular in the mainstream media. Have any of you, which, I know for a fact there's some cases going on here. Have any of you come across a case recently where you heard about sexual trafficking occurring in this area? <coughs> and whether it be the news, the internet, or anything. None of you all have heard about that? Okay, well, just so you're aware, and you guys can go and Google this, Fairfax specifically, but Northern Virginia and DC, has a gigantic problem with child sexual exploitation. Huge problem. Uh, some people believe that it's entirely gang related. I don't. I don't believe that. I don't think it's entirely gang related. Although there are some gang issues, I do not think that it's. That's entirely the subject matter. Uh, me, for example, I was a victim of sexual trafficking when I was 14. Had nothing to do with gang activity. Absolutely not. So these there's. Uh, some, uh, some organizations would like to predicate that that's the uh, only people who are victims of sexual trafficking are people from urban areas or from poorer areas. And that's, although that's, it, it, it's more common, that's not necessarily the case. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna, just a few myths, we're gonna debunk a few of the sexual trafficking myths that are out there right now. You might hear, especially if you start looking at the media, start Googling things, you might see some statistics that aren't true. The big thing is to always look for when the citing. Where did they get this information? If you see a statistic and there is no cite, somebody made that up. They heard it from somebody, you heard every, everything that you are provided in this presentation is researched and cited. So, okay. Let's go with the first one. Uh, only girls are sexual trafficking victims. I'm sure y'all can understand that, but that's not true. No, it's, uh, it's currently estimated that um, up to 50% of the victims of child sexual exploitation in the United States are boys. The problem is, is that one, we don't have enough resources, really. To, most of the resources are focused on girls, which is understandable because that's the first thing you think of when you think somebody who's being sexually exploited, you think that it would be a female, of course. But another part of that is victims coming forward. And with boys who later become men, it can become very, very difficult for them to come forward as a victim or as a survivor, especially if they are not homosexual. If they are heterosexual and were forced into homosexual acts, it can make coming forward and speaking about their experiences very, very difficult because they are worried about how people will perceive them and their experiences. So that's one of the reasons why we don't hear a lot about boys, but the reality is they are having just as much of an issue with sexual trafficking as girls are. Okay. 
Teenagers engaged in commercial sexual activity are being forced with threats of harm from their pimp or other type of sexual trafficker. No. He okay. Who in here has seen the movie Taken? Everybody. Everybody. Who thinks when you get sexually trafficked you get thrown into the back of a trunk and you get locked up into a basement and you never see your family again? Is that the idea you get when you think of sexual trafficking? Yep. I can see all your heads. Yep. All right. I'm going to be honest with you. The truth of the matter is most victims of sexual trafficking don't even consider them to themselves to be victims at the time that it's occurring to them. Most of them feel some kind of relationship with the person that they are having, uh, that they are being abused by, whether it's a pimp, you want to call it a pimp, a sexual trafficker, or an abuser, it doesn't matter what label you want to put on it. Uh, the reality is, is if they don't see themselves as a victim, they're not going to attempt to get themselves out of that situation. Even though it's a bad situation, they're not going to attempt to get themselves out. Now, how is it that these people are able to control children without throwing them in the back of a trunk. How can you do that? Well, <clears throat> the next portion of this, sexual trafficking is the most traumatic thing a person can go through. I can tell you from personal experience that is not the case whatsoever. There are way worse things that you can have happen in your life. Okay. Many survivors and current victims report histories of complex polytraumatization, meaning that they have endured several forms of trauma prior to their entry into commercial sex. Children's Health Care of Atlanta found a rate of 80 to 90 percent of, sec of known sexual trafficking victims had prior sexual abuse in their childhoods. 80 to 90 percent. Now, obviously, not everybody here has personal experience with being an abuse victim, but I'm sure that logically speaking, all of you could understand that being abused by somebody you know and you care about is far more traumatic than being abused by a stranger. And that's where I'm coming to with talking about taken and this idea that Americans have that if you are a sexual trafficking victim, you were kidnapped, you were forced, somebody took you, they got you locked up in a basement somewhere and guys just file in. There's a much easier tactic because a girl like that or a boy like that, I should be, be honest about that, a girl or a boy like that, they can run away. They can, they could tell whoever it is that they're engaging in commercial sex with, they could tell them I'm being held here, help me. What's a much easier way to get a child to do what you tell them. You give them love. You give them whatever it is in their life that they don't have right now. So if you have abusive parents or a parent that's say a single parent that has to work several jobs, they're not there, not giving you the time that you need, oh, well your abuser will give you all the love in the world. You just gotta do this for him. Love is a far more easier tactic to coerce a child than force ever will be. And it's more permanent because if that child gets picked up for prostitution, depending on the state, some states have safe harbor laws that prevent that from happening, but if that child gets picked up for prostitution, most likely, first, first of all, most likely they're not going to say who their abuser or pimp is. They are probably going to lie about their age and not admit how old they actually are. There's just there's a, there's a sense of protection of the abuser, and that's what protect that it it really does protect them. And it's like I said, if you kidnap somebody, they're they're gonna be mad at you. But if you convince somebody, oh, well, I love you, baby. I'll do whatever I'll do whatever you need. I'll take care of you. I just need you to do this for me. So my point is is that uh, there's a lot of misconceptions right now as to what sexual trafficking is and what a victim goes through. And I think that that movie Taken did, <laughs> did a lot more harm than good, although that was a really good movie.
Uh, the last, last myth I want to um, go ahead and cover is um, men are the traffickers and Johns who buy children who are sexually exploited. No, that is not the case. It has been found that uh, women do play a very huge role in victimization. Uh, it is not just men out there who are abusing children. I can tell you from my own experience that it is not just men who purchase uh, children for the purposes of sex. I can tell you that women do too. Um, based on a study by Conway in 2012, uh, several reports, uh, but Conway specifically, uh, estimates the number of female abusers to range from 35 to 40 percent. It's pretty big. That's pretty big, because you would think between men and women, women are supposed to have that empathy. They're supposed to have that, that uh, motherly instinct to protect children. So you would think women wouldn't be doing something like that, but they are. It's the truth, because a lot of times they themselves were victims 10 years, 10 years beforehand. That's, they were in the same position as that child, and their pimp just kept them around long enough. Now they're help, helping to abuse the next generation of kids. You see that quite often. And as I said, in my own personal experience, I have, uh, I, I have been abused by women. So it's, not, it's definitely not something that is restricted to men. Okay, one thing, I would, the only thing I'm gonna ask all of you to write down before you leave today, actually probably be a good time to do it now if you have, if you have a pen. Um, this is the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline. You can get it from somebody else later if you don't have a pen, it's okay. There's no quit. Yeah, I was going to say, if you want, put it in your cell phone contacts. Because I'm going to tell you, if you ever see somebody, just randomly, you see something that doesn't look right, call that number. You're not doing anything wrong by calling them. Those people are trained to know what a human trafficking and a sexual trafficking victim is. So all you gotta do is say, hey, you know, I saw these guys down the street and they were doing some construction work and I don't know, it looks like there might be some labor trafficking going on there. There's some signs that I saw. I, I don't see these guys ever taking breaks. They work from dawn till dusk, you know, little things. Things that you know make you uncomfortable when you see them. When you get uncomfortable, that's your, that's your inside telling you something's, something's not right. And you can use that number, and that number is a non-police uh, enforcement uh, type of number. It, it is run by the organization Polaris Project. So if you call, you're not getting anybody in trouble. You're just possibly saving somebody's life. That's all. But it's an important number to have. Okay. I know all this might sound a little crazy to all of you. Sexual trafficking, children being abused, hundreds of thousands of children possibly being abused in the United States. That doesn't sound right, does it? That doesn't sound like the America that we all kind of grew up to know. We're supposed to be America where we're safe and things, bad things don't happen to people like us. That's just not the case. It's, uh, that's why I was interested to see if any of you had heard anything in the media recently about sexual trafficking or human trafficking because it's frequently in the media now, especially in your area. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up so you guys can ask your questions. Um, I know that it's a little bit weird to see me standing here and saying that I was a victim of sexual trafficking when obviously I'm standing here in a business suit and I don't look like I was a victim of sexual trafficking in any way. Uh, but I assure you that um, many, many years ago I was. Um, and to this day, I still deal with the ramifications of that. I am still in uh, therapy. I still deal with many things. Um, in fact, I'll give you an example. Just today on the plane ride in, I was very touched because I saw a family. There was a family in front of me in coach. There was mom and dad, little child, seven, about seven years old. And then in the seats next to me was grandma and grandpa with the little baby about two years old. And the whole this flight's only about two hours, it's not a big deal. But through the whole flight, the baby was crying. Because it's a little baby. You know, they get their ears popping and they don't know what to do. But the whole time, 
grandpa is just adamant trying to make this baby calm down and you could see the connection between the family that they you know they it was obvious that for many many years they had been bonding and for me sitting there just sitting there waiting for the plane to land so I could looking at my speech looking at my notes I'm watching this family and I felt myself tear up just a little bit and I stopped myself saying, no, no, you, you got to go give the speech. You can't be crying right now. But I started getting welled up because I'm going to be honest, I didn't have a family like that. I didn't have a mother that protected me and I didn't have a father that wanted me. So even now, even though I'm 30 years old and I have a family of my own, when I see that, it hurts. It hurts. So there's a lot of ways that a sexual trafficking victim, even when they transition from victim to survivor, they can still get triggered. There's a million different things that can trigger the emotions that they felt once upon a time. Repeat it for us. Okay, so I saw an article online not too long ago about how the Super Bowl is a huge problem for sex trafficking, and I just wanted to know more about that. Well, I will... I. I will say that in a lot of sporting events, the Super Bowl specifically, but um, also the World Cup, um, media outlets tend to gravitate towards sensationalism. So uh, yes, it has been stated by uh, the last couple of years that the sexual trafficking uh, spikes during Super Bowl and that all these people come in, they rape all these children, and that's the end of it. Okay, well, look, clear a few things up. Yes, that does happen. It, it, as far as any time you have an influx of population going into one particular city, you are going to see high rates of commercial sex, whether it be prostitution or sexual trafficking. Um, a perfect example, the, um, just uh, the last election, I'm from Florida, we had the, um, Republican National Convention in Tampa. Um, most people would not think, wouldn't come to their mind immediately, that there would be a huge influx of prostitution when politicians all show up in mass. No one would ever think that. But it, it, if you uh, were to go and look on Craigslist during that weekend, you would find that there was quite a bit of advertisement out there, Craigslist and all the different personal ads. Uh, so any time where you get an influx of people, you are going to see a technical spike. But I think that there's a lot of sensationalism um, that the media puts around that. I think that they would be more informative if they made it clear that the <laughs> once the Super Bowl is over, the sexual trafficking doesn't end then. And that's, that's what I don't like about the, um, the media covering it in that particular way, because it really makes it sound like, oh, well, once the Super Bowl is over, everybody's okay again. Everybody went home, so now we don't have to worry about it. It's not happening anymore. That's just not the case. Okay. Next question. <coughs> Hi, how are you doing? Hi. Um, I had to write my question down. No, don't. Remember. That's fine. Uh, I had notes too, didn't you notice? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, so I noticed that you stated that love was uh, a key attribute towards luring children in mm -hmm. to sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that because it was, uh, they were lured in with love, it was more so voluntary. So for you, I wanted to know what way that the, any personnel that lured you into the same system, how did they get you to just voluntarily? Um, That's a wonderful question. Bring yourself in. So, how did I? How did I become a sexual trafficking victim? How was I able to be lured in? Well, first of all, this is going back. When I was 14, AOL was the big new thing. Not everybody had it, but it was very growing very rapidly. Um, not a whole lot of people knew about computers, and the ones who did, their parents definitely didn't know anything about them, especially not the internet. So uh, my generation kind of got lucky 
that we were able to do a lot of things online that our parents had absolutely no idea what we were doing because they didn't even know how to get online. Um, I met my trafficker online uh, when I was 13 and just beforehand I had had my grandfather pass away. And my, now if you listen to the Smith interview I did with Kevin Smith in 2011, um, I give a little bit more of a detailed description of that, uh, of my home life. But what I went through most for most of my childhood is my grandfather was the only positive influence that I had in my life. So my father wasn't around. My mother was very uh, physically and mentally abusive. She was also um, a drug addict and alcoholic. For me, what the big thing is, and this goes back to the um, children, uh, Children's Health Care of Atlanta uh, quote about 80 to 90 percent of uh, sexual trafficking victims having prior sexual abuse. I was abused for most of my life sexually. And that is what is um, commonly referred to as um, preparing. You get, you prep, when you want to, when you want to abuse a child, you get them prepped. You get them ready, or at least the, the ones that are experienced and understand how to manipulate children. You, you put little things out there to see if they'll respond. I'll give you a perfect example. When I was 12 years old, a gentleman, the, the last gentleman that uh, uh, abused me before I got into the sexual trafficking, the way he could tell if I would be po have give it have a positive reaction to his advances, my bra one day, my bra strap, and I was 12, my bra strap was showing, and he very very carefully picked my bra strap up and put it back so that it wasn't showing. I wasn't his kid. I wasn't. I didn't even know him very well. But that was a very quick way for him to tell. Did I, like, you touch me, you touch my bra? That's how most 12 year olds would react, especially a 40 year old man touches your bra. Me, when I was seven years old, my stepfather molested me. And the very first thing I did was report it to my parents. They didn't, re my mom didn't react in the way that she should have. She took her husband's side made me believe that it was all something I had dreamed. So I went to the school instead. Well, she's not going to listen to me. I'll go tell my teacher. Guess what? I got taken away from home. And I got taken away for over a year. And if it wasn't for certain family members, I would end up in the foster system. I'm going to tell you that that experience is what set the course for my entire life. Because that experience taught me at seven years old if you are hurt and you tell somebody, you're the one that's going to get in trouble. My stepfather never went to jail because they could not prove DNA-wise he was the one that abused me. It was proven I had been abused, but they couldn't prove that he did it. So I have to say he allegedly abused me. But if you think about it, I was abused by four other people after that between the ages of seven and 12. So five guys, five different men all abused me. And none of them really knew each other. They weren't like, you know, like there wasn't a gang of guys. They were like, hey, there's a girl down the street that you go do this with. They were just associates of people that my mom knew, friends that she, my mom had a very, very bad habit of just leaving me with random people and drug, you know. Drug addicts and alcoholics sometimes make bad choices. My mother made a series of bad choices, and unfortunately that also led to a series of sexual abuse. So, back to the sexual trafficking. That, if that gives you a little bit of a mindset of where I was at at 14 years old, at this point in my life, the one person that gave me real unconditional safe love is passed away. He's gone. I don't have him anymore. I can't turn to my mom because she beats the crap out of me all the time and tells me I'm worthless and tells me she wishes she had an abortion. You know, so I was looking for somebody to care about me. When your parents don't care about you, that's a very deep thing. Or even if you feel like they don't care about you, that's a very deep thing. And it's a, it, 
it's something that an abuser can recognize very, very easily. It's, I mean, I'm online at 14 years old, 13, 14 years old, I'm online talking online on the computer at 3 o'clock in the morning. Obviously, I'm not being very well watched. You know, I don't, care, I don't care what day and age it was. I shouldn't have been up at 3 o'clock in the morning on a computer with nobody checking on me, especially not on a school night. Okay, so the sexual trafficking portion of it. How did he lure me in? He didn't lure me in. He didn't. I'm going to be honest. Frank, allegedly, because he wasn't ever arrested either. Actually, when I was a victim of sexual trafficking, sexual trafficking was not even on the federal books as a law. There was no such thing as human trafficking. There was no such thing as sexual trafficking. There was prostitution, and that's it. That's it. Okay, so he couldn't even have been convicted even if he had ever been arrested. He couldn't have been convicted because the law didn't exist yet. The law wouldn't be created for another three years at the federal level. The state levels would take even longer. So I was in Florida. He was in Atlanta. I started flying out to see him. First he came to see me, and he set it up. Oh, I'm so in love with you. I need you. I don't care about how old you are. I don't care about your mom. I just want to take care of you. I've got an idea. Why don't you come stay with me? Why? I'll take care of you. Let's get married. We could get married. I said, well, I'm 14 years old. I can't marry you. That's not even legal. But he had all these ideas. He was trying to convince me. We're in a relationship together. I'm your boyfriend. Eventually it turned into, I'm your fiance, you know? So he lures me in with this promise of, well, I got all this money, and I love you, and I want to take care of you. So, okay, somebody wants to take care of me. It's about, about time somebody wanted to take care of me because I've been taking care of myself this whole time. So I go out to Atlanta, and the first, time or two, he never asked me to do nothing. He asked me to be with him physically, but he never asked me to do anything that I felt uncomfortable with. He let me get comfortable. He let me start falling in love with him for real. And then by about the third time, I would fly out there about twice a month. You got to figure I'm 14 years old at the time. Anybody else find it weird that a 14-year-old is flying between Tampa and Atlanta with no parental guidance and nobody seems to care? Okay. Well, by the, about the third time I got out there, he, uh, he decided to let me know, well, you know how we've been trying to make love and it doesn't really work out? Well, you know what would really make me happy? If you had sex with these people over here. I can't really do it myself. But if you did it with them, it would make you, me love you so much. And I believed them because I was a stupid 14 year old girl. I didn't know any better. I didn't understand that if a man loves you, he's not going to ask you to go have sex with random people. I just knew how he made me feel, which was the opposite of what everybody else in my life made me feel. He made me feel good about myself. He bought me things. He took me to nice places. He took me to Woodstock 99. I mean, he treated me very, very well. But he also asked me to do things that you should never ask a child to do. And I'm going to let you know that it took me a very long time not to blame myself for what happened. I thought because, even though I was 14, I thought because I was saying yes to everything he asked. By the time I got to be an adult, even though I recognized what he did was wrong, I felt like I was a part of this. That I was like, that I wasn't forced. Because I never said no. And that's where we come into coercion. And that's why I made sure to point out at the very beginning of this lecture that love is so powerful. Because even until I was 21 years old, in therapy, I still thought it was my fault. And the only thing that was able to convince me that it was not my fault was my therapist one day, and I'll never forget it. He said to me, he says, Jamie, let me ask you a question. If Frank came to you today, and you're 21 years old, and he says, Jamie, I want you to go over there and sleep with these people. 
would you do it? I looked at him like he was crazy. I said, no, actually, I don't know what I said, hell no, no. I said, I would never, I said, I'm a, number one, I'm a married woman. Number two, I wouldn't put myself through that kind of risk. It's dangerous, there's diseases, you could get arrested, there's a, all the, a whole bunch of reasons not to do something like that. And he pointed out to me, he says, well, how did you feel when you were 14 years old? I said, oh, well, I said, yes. I said, yes, to everything he said. I never questioned, I didn't even question it. He says, that's how you know that it wasn't your fault. Because as an adult, you would not make those same choices today. That shows that I wasn't even actually making a choice. He was making a choice for me. And that's where we get into coercion. That's why, that's why like I said, I, it's, uh, it's something that we see very, very commonly uh, with pimps and abusers, sexual traffickers. It's not a matter of them beating some girl to death saying, you're gonna go sleep with 30 guys tonight. Am I saying that doesn't happen? No, that does happen. But is that common, especially with children? No, no. It, there are much, foster children are at a very high risk. Um, there's currently a bill in the federal legislation. It's in subcommittee right now, kind of stuck there. I've been working for the last month or so trying to get it unstuck. Uh, this specifically has to do with sexual trafficking and the foster care system because they're finding that upwards of 60% of these kids are at risk because it goes right back to uh, not having that love that you need, not having that, it doesn't have to be an actual biological parent, parent, grandparent, aunt, adopted parent, foster parent, doesn't matter. One person has to love you when you were a kid, one. Otherwise, anybody can manip manipulate you. Anybody can manipulate how you think, what you do. That's why you see so many kids join gangs, because they need love. Gangs are the same, and gangs get into sexual trafficking, too. You know, it's the needing that connection with people. But we're just trying to get, some people try to connect with the wrong types of people. Maybe that the types of people aren't that healthy for them. Same thing with me. Frank was not a healthy person to be around, obviously. But it was my choice to leave. It was my choice to say, I don't want to do this anymore. This doesn't feel right. And what made me make that choice was actually the man I ended up marrying, oddly enough. He was just a friend of mine at the time, my next door neighbor. And he was one of the few people in the world that knew what was going on. My mom didn't even know what was going on. She knew I was going to Atlanta every couple of weeks to be with this guy, this older guy, Frank. But she didn't know what I was doing besides that. Chase knew though, because I told him. And he never judged me for it. He never was like, oh, you a hoe. <laughs> That'd be most people's reactions. He said to me, he says, Jamie, I gotta tell you, a man that truly loves you would never ever ask you to do something like that. If he cares about you in his heart, he'll want to protect you. And that's not protecting you. He says he's using you. He says, now it's your choice. I'm not going to tell you you need to stop going. I'm not going to tell you you don't need to be with him. That's your choice. That's your, like I said, he was just my friend at the time. But he brought up a point to me I'd never thought about. I said, oh. So this isn't love? Because I'm used to being abused, so the fact that he's nice at all, to me, seems non-abusive. But in reality, he was abusing me just as much as I was being abused in my home life. What's scary is, is that I preferred his abuse to the abuse I was receiving at home from my mother. That's the scary part. And that's why I say earlier that um, one of the myths is that sexual trafficking is the worst thing that somebody could ever have happened to them. It's not. I'll tell you, for me, the worst thing that ever happened to me is having a mother that didn't love me and wasn't there for me. And I'm going to tell you, when I go into my therapy sessions every week, although we do talk about sexual trafficking at times, the majority of things that we're talking about have to do with her. Because she let me down. I see the series of events that if she had been there from day one, none of this stuff would have happened. But there's another way to look at it. 
I wouldn't be with my husband today, who I've been with now half my life, and I wouldn't be standing in right here talking to all of you, making all of you aware that sexual trafficking, sexual exploitation of children is occurring in our country, and it's occurring at an extremely high rate. It's occurring right under our noses. When I was a victim, I was a freshman in high school, and I was enrolled in high school. I stayed in high school the entire time. My grades didn't look so awesome, <laughs> but at the time, teachers, they weren't trained to look for this kind of stuff. They just figured that I didn't come to school very often. Airlines, travel industry, they are currently being trained on how to identify possible victims of trafficking. The reason is, is because it's, it's recognized that the travel industry, airlines, hotels, what have you, that's one of the first places that you're going to see sexual trafficking. It's one of the first places that you're going to have the ability to identify a possible victim. So, kind of went along long way with that question. Pull to Kevin Smith on that one. <laughs> well, thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yes? I want to know how, how you, you, because children are so, you said they, they get into these relationships and they're so loving and they're going to protect their abuser. How do you get a child away from that? It's very difficult, and most of the time there will be relapse, what we call relapse. Relapse is what happens is when you get a child away from their pimp and they go back. They go back because that's the person who loves them. If you ask me to this day if I have any animosity towards Frank, no. No. Because he never really did anything to hurt me. He didn't have any, he, he had no real responsibility to me. He didn't really do anything to hurt me personally, physically. Did he have me do things that were damaging to me? Of course he did. Were they wrong? Yes, they were abusive. But did he personally commit any abuses towards me? And no, they didn't. Would I defend him? No, I wouldn't defend him. But would I seek to go after him in some way? No. It's not worth my time. It's a long time ago. I'd rather just never see him again, personally. But that's where the whole love thing comes back in, especially when you are first taking a trafficking victim away from their pimp. Like, say it's a situation where the child is, or teenager, whoever, is found by police officer, and the pimp is also caught at the same time, or they're not caught. The likelihood is, is that the teenager or the, the child is not going to report who that person is. They're not going to try to, uh, they're not going to try to put the spotlight on them. If anything, they might lie about their age. They must, oh, I'm 18. I'm 18. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm, I, and then they get charged because the police don't know that they're a minor who is not legally able to be charged with prostitution. So. Getting that, it, what, it's a process, and uh, a lot of organizations have found this, that over time, you have to trust that they will continue to come back on their own. That if you have a, if you have a place that you're providing services, they might choose to go back to their pimp one day because they need the love, or they need some rent money, they want to buy a new pair of shoes, something like that. Relapse happens. Same thing with alcoholism, same thing with drug addiction. Uh, we all have things that we need in our lives. And when somebody provides that for you, it's really hard to cut that off, and especially if it's done by force. If, a, like I said, a police officer or a, um, a Department of Children's Services type of agency swoops in and picks up a teenager, first of all, I think all of you know that teenagers are not the easiest people to get along with. <laughs> so to put a teenager in a situation where they are put into some kind of group home, they are being interviewed by police, they're just very, very uncomfortable, possibly going into the foster system, 
Do you really think that they're going to be like, yeah, this is great? Or no, they're going to go back to the person who holds them at night and says, oh, baby, I love you. I love you. I'm going to take care of you. You know, so it's just, it's hard to break, it's a hard to break that cycle. Just like, it's hard to break quitting smoking. It's hard to quit smoking. It's that addiction. We get addi we all get addicted to things and love, especially for someone who doesn't have love in their life or doesn't have support in their life. Once you have it, you don't necessarily want it taken away. Even me, I went through what I went through with Frank for a year. I recognized pretty quick that what I, what I was doing and that I wasn't comfortable with it, but I wanted to make him happy because he loved me. He loved me, so I was going to do everything in my power to make him happy. And you know what? I do that to this day with my husband to the point where it can be a little bit damaging to our relationship because he's not going to give me that same amount of love back. He's not going to give me that undying love because he's got a family that cares about him. He doesn't need my love the way I need it, the way I need his. And that comes from the years of abuse. It comes from constantly feeling like somebody is going to let me down. So if somebody does love me, I'm going to hold on to them. I'm going to have that death grip on them and never let them go, even if I smother them to death. <laughs> so um, that's why it's a, it, it is a little bit hard to break that cycle. I'm of the opinion that, uh, especially once you start getting into your late teen years, uh, 16, 17, 18 years old, I think it becomes a personal choice whether you leave your pimp or not. I mean, obviously the state can make you leave so many times, but you're, you might go back. You know, there's just, and that's not saying anything wrong against that person if they do go back. It's just they had a need that they needed to fill. It might not have been the best, healthiest way to fulfill that need any more than if you're sad and you decide, I'm going to get drunk tonight. That might not be a healthy way. It's just all it's doing is covering up all the pain you're going to feel, and the next morning you're going to feel all that pain again, and you're going to feel just as crappy. Same thing about going back to your pimp. It's the same thing. You're going to feel like crap. You're gonna feel, you might get your needs met in the moment, but after the fact, when you think about it, like, oh, well, I started this GED class, and then I went and did this. I went and paid my rent the wrong way, because that's all I can do, because I'm in GED class. What am I supposed to do, go work at McDonald's? You know how many times I've heard that? And it's a good point. If you, let's say you don't have a pimp, let's just say that you are prostituting yourself out because even if you are under the age of 18 and you are voluntarily prostituting yourself, you are still a sexual trafficking victim. Why? Why? You are not 18 yet. You cannot consent to sex. So even if there's no abuser, no pimp involved, 16-year-old girl, maybe she's a runaway, maybe she's just trying to help somebody pay bills, whatever, how is it that she's going to go out and make, let's say, let's say ballpark? Let's say she goes out and makes $500 in a night. Where is she going to find another job like that with no education? Where are you going to make money like that with no GED? All of y'all in college for a reason, right? You won't make the money. You guys don't want to work at McDonald's. It's kind of hard to go work at McDonald's for minimum wage, especially after taxes. You work 40 hours a week and you get a check for $240. I'm going to tell you what. I'll tell you, from pers I'll tell you from my personal experience, I wouldn't go work at McDonald's if that was my choice. Even, even now, if I had a choice between working at McDonald's or going dancing on a pole and making $500 a night, I'm going to go for the easy money. Luckily for me, I got the things that I need. I got mental health care, and I got an education. And those are the two big things every sexual trafficking victim is going to need. They are going to need the mental health care for a long, 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 long time. I have been in and out of mental health care for the last 12 years or so. Um, I don't expect it to end anytime soon. 
The other thing is education, and it just goes back to what my original point was just now, that financially speaking, you cannot get out of the sex industry, whether it be stripping, prostitution, porn, any of that. You can't get out of it if you don't have a way to supplement that income. It's just people don't make that choice. You don't choose to be poor. We might be poor just because, but we never make the choice to be poor. At least most people don't, I don't think. Okay, I believe you had a question. I have a question. I don't know, this may be a little personal. That's a, no, you can ask personal questions. I might not answer it, but you can ask. <laughs> do you have any kids or do you plan on having kids? That's a good question. I, question? She asked if I have any children. Uh, no, I don't have any kids. Um, and what I'm actually hoping is that my kids become the Wayne Foundation's kids. I mean, no, I, I, I haven't had any children, even though I've been with my husband for a very long time. We have not been blessed with children. But the way I look at it, the Wayne Foundation's my baby. That's my kid. That's why I'm standing in front of you today, brave in the snow, because I'm going to tell you what, I hate snow. <laughs> so obviously this means something to me, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. I would have been like looking at the weather like, can we reschedule this? I, um, I think that it's very, very important that people understand what's happening to these kids out here because to be honest, if we don't see them, nobody's going to see them. They're invisible. That's what I get a lot of questions. What are the numbers? Tell us the numbers of sexual trafficking victims. If you notice that quote from the National Exploited Children, uh, National Exploited Children, Missing and Exploited Children, the 100 to 293,000 children, if you notice that, it says at risk. That was changed about three years ago. It used to say, being, that, that, that those were the numbers of children estimated that were being abused. We can't estimate that. We can estimate how many are at risk, but like with me, I was still going to high school when I was doing my sexual trafficking year. I, there was nothing that would have sent up a red flag to somebody who was not already trained to know what to look for. So what I hope is, is that, to go back to your question about kids, I hope since I don't have any children of my own and most likely won't have any children of my own, that the kids that we take care of through the Wayne Foundation, whether we're providing them with just services or we're providing them with an actual home, regardless, I hope that the support that we give them, that eventually those will be my kids. Because I, I I'm going to be honest, I don't know, uh, we have not got, the Wayne Foundation has not gotten to the point of providing services yet, but in my mind, I know there's a bunch of kids out there that are already mine, and when we start providing services, those will be my kids. I'm going to care about them. I already know in my heart. I know what kind of person I am, and I know why I'm doing this. I'm going to care about them like they were my own kids, so I guess that's I guess that's the best answer I can give you. But as far as any plans for in the future, no, we're not, we're not planning to have kids. Yes? Um, speaking of kids and getting them out of those situations, uh, I have a question. I okay. wrote it down, so I'm going to read That's it. fine. Okay. Um, for children that are removed from these situations, are they going to be represented by an advocate against their traffickers, or are they going to be obligated and subjected to standing trial against their abusers in order for them to be caught and stopped? Okay. The, there's a lot of factors there. One is the state. It, um, although there is a federal human trafficking law and a federal sexual trafficking law, the, how these laws are, are implemented are, is um, completely up to the state. Um, I don't know of, now I don't know of every case out there, but I don't know of any cases where somebody was forced to testify. But I think that that also brings up the question of where we were talking about earlier, are they going to say who their pimp is? Unless they were caught with the pimp, are they even going to turn them in? You know, it, it, I think that that becomes the bigger question is, 
are we going to get the pimp to the point of being actually being prosecuted? Because the reality is probably not. Well, we might find the sexual trafficking victim, and we might get them out of the situation even temporarily, but as far as prosecution, I wouldn't say that it's it, prosecution, for, especially for sexual trafficking itself, and not just for um, commercial sex like pimping. As a rule, that's that's a federal charge. That's a hard thing to get the stick. So that's why you see the the cases that you do see are generally um, when there's multiple victims, um, a lot of victims, and you see. Uh, see it more with labor trafficking than you do with sexual trafficking. Although there has been several um, uh, sexual trafficking uh, victims that have come forward and those abusers were put away, the, I would say the reality is, is that there's not a lot of pimps and johns going to jail for this. But the way I look at it, that kind of crosses into a moral line of whether prostitution is okay or not. And for me, personally, once you turn 18, I don't care what you do with your life. If you choose to do that with your life, I would hope you don't make that choice because I understand that there's probably a reason you got to that place in your life. But what I'm worried about is kids because kids don't have a choice, kids don't have a say. I cannot tell you how many times I called the police on my mother for abusing me, beat the crap out of me. I mean, down on the floor beating the crap out of me. She scratched her arms up as soon as the cops showed up. She did it. She attacked me. And they'd be telling me I was the one that was going to go to jail. 13 years old, tell me, we're going to put you in juvie if you don't stop messing with your mom and I'm like can y'all see that she's messed up that she's that she's obviously on something am I the only person that can see this and that's the way I felt and that's honestly that's why Frank was able to snake in the way he was because I was trying to get people to help me I went to her brother my uncle I love him to death he's my only uncle but at the time he did not want to hear about my mom's drug addiction or her alcoholism because as far as he was concerned she held a steady job she paid her bills none of his business except for the fact that when she would do those things she would beat the living crap out of me that's the part that he didn't seem to quite understand um, so no matter who I would go to there was nobody saying hey Jamie I got your back I'll make sure nobody hurts you and tell Frank. And then he raised his hand and he says, oh, I'll make sure nobody hurts you. Well, except me, of course. But I'll make sure that your mom doesn't hurt you. And in my mind, that was the, that was the big thing. So like I said earlier, I had basically two abusive situations, one in Atlanta, one in Florida. I felt like the sexual trafficking was the least harmful of the two. That's not a good thing. Okay. Jamie, yes. We're out of time, okay, we're out of time. Oh, there's a couple other things I want to tell you. Uh, first of all, as Jamie said, there are Smith interviews. If you find those, that's Kevin Smith, the director. You find his interviews with Jamie. You can. They're on our her. website. Yes, you can hear her entire story, uh, and I guarantee, if you didn't break down in tears listening to her today, you absolutely will listening to that two part. It has a don't, it has a good ending to it, so don't make it. A, it very is happy. Very, it, yeah. It's very no. It is. It, it's graphic in nature. It, it, it's in two parts. It's around two and a half hours each part. Um, the first one is extremely depressing, admittedly, but. If if you get through it and can get to the second one, or if you just want to skip to the second one, um, it has a very good ending at least. And there's one other thing we want to do really quickly. I'm sorry, uh, just one second. Uh, we have Taylor here, and Taylor has uh, something for Jamie. So, so hi everyone. Um, I want to first off, can everyone just give a round of applause for Jamie? I sure a really long speech, so I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> anyway, so okay. my name is Taylor Lamb, and uh, I'm standing here with some of our members of Innovators. And 
I can tell you that I stand before you as more of an enlightened person. Um, sex trafficking might not have affected me directly, but I know, and I think it's important for all of us to know, that this is a real issue, and it happens. And it happens in our very own country. It happens in our very own state. It happens in our very own neighbors, homes, and schools. This can affect you know, your, your little siblings, your neighbors' kids. It can affect anyone that you know that is vulnerable and needs love. So I, I just think that it's very important that <laughs> it's very important that information like this about sex trafficking is known because a lot of these children go through these abuse, you know, without getting any help. So <laughs> anyways, it's definitely not depicted like we all know in our movies like Taken. Um, okay, so, <sighs> okay. You might have seen some of us who are wearing the Way Foundation t-shirts around. Uh, we have been on this venture the past seven months trying to raise awareness about sex trafficking, uh, but telling people about the goal of the Wayne Foundation and definitely raising awareness um, about this charity. And we have actually been through a lot. We've been through cold weather, warm weather, all making different like baked goods, mm -hmm. pasta. If any of you guys have seen us, we've been all around the school trying to do our best to raise uh, awareness uh, for this cause. You guys are gonna make me cheer up, oh my god. <laughs> I knew you guys were working, but I didn't know you were working that hard. <laughs> I think mean, I'm working hard. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank the following people that have led up to this very moment, this very day. Uh, definitely Tate McCarl and Tameka Jackson, who created the LEAD program. Um, from there, they were able to inform us about the Wade Foundation and Jamie Walton. Mm -hmm. I also like to thank the innovators themselves, all 26 and some members of you guys who have valiantly uh, pursued this project with us to the very end. I'd also like to thank the club advisor and presidents uh, who have participated in Penny Wars. You guys were awesome. They definitely raised uh, a good amount of money. Um, I definitely like to thank all of you guys that came here today to come out and support Jamie Walton and hear out her story. And actually, on behalf of the innovators, and all of everyone here and the students of NOVA, we'd like to present you this check, check, <laughs> of $3,610.76. Six, $3, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's wonderful. In the middle. Yeah. There we go. Taylor, help her. Oh. <laughs> I, I really appreciate this is the second time I've been invited to uh, Northern Virginia Community College. Um, I have a standing agreement uh, with Brian and with Tank that anytime they want to invite me, I'm happy to come out snow or shine obviously <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm happy to speak to you guys just because like I said it, it's it's very important that people become aware of the situation because we can't help any victims until we know there's a problem you know there's too many people in our country that is completely unaware that there's a problem so now what is there what about 40 people in here 50 people in here something like that now all of you are aware. Now all of you can go home and you can say to your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your mom or your dad, guess what I heard about today? You are never going to believe what I heard at school today. <laughs> Tell one person. That's what I'm going to charge you guys with. Go home. I don't care who. Tell a stranger. I don't care. You might not have any family. Tell a stranger. Tell your roommate. Tell one person you know, though about what you heard here today and see what their reaction is. Watch, the, Especially watch their face when you tell them it's happening here to our kids. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be shocked most likely. <laughs> Thank you. Round of applause for all of you as well. Oh.